Smooth and Curly on video. You know, have you ever thought about like, I mean, they, they make hosts horses. Yes. So what if the horses have like maximum intelligence? <laughs> like that would suck to be like that. <laughs> Stop horsing around. Ah, but I mean, seriously though, why is it, why is no one, look, this is an important question, Michael. Why is no one worried about the horses? They're hosts, they're smart. They're stronger than people. Yeah, and, and imagine they've got their intelligence turned up to 20 or whatever the maximum number is. You're that smart and that empathic and that conniving and whatever the other ones are. The problem is you don't have opposable hooves. You don't have opposable hooves. And so you're sitting there. No one's worried about them becoming sentient. No one's going, oh, but what about the poor horses? Maybe they need to get to the maze. Maybe they to get out to the room. No one's worried about that. Nobody's talking about the horses. Nobody's worrying about what they're thinking or what they're feeling. They can't even speak. Think about how terrible that is. Can you imagine being hurt and then having to sit in a chair and have uh, Bernard talk to you and say, analysis, and all you can go is, eh. I mean, what is that? That is terrible. They're the, they're the ones who are suffering, Michael. The, the real victims here. Speaking of which, was tying the man in blacks, uh, you know, tying a noose around his neck and the other end to a horse, a way of getting around the inability to kill him? Or would the horse have not? I mean, I, mm -hmm. I think he died. I think he could have died. Because again, the problem is no one's worrying about the horses. Someone's actually, I remember reading an argument that uh, the dominant the dominant, the actual dominant species on the planet is corn. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we are one episode from the end. This is a weird episode. To, so I was thinking during the episode, what will Charles say about the style here? Because we have been talking about murder mystery as kind of a, a structure for a narrative. And this to me became more like, um, the kind of movie that you're supposed to watch when you're taking drugs. Well, there's the big reveal, which is that Bernard is a recreation, homage uh, of Arnold. Bernarnold. I, I like that actually, Commissioner Bernarnold. So Bernarnold, uh, and he, and he uh, rediscovers that he, <laughs> is a, um, that he is a host because uh, Maeve, tells him so. Um, yeah, like it was sort of there on the edge of his awareness, but then she like forced him to contend with it. Right, and so he goes and asks Ford to help him figure out what's going on. In order to go all the way back to the beginning, he had to let go of his keystone, which was his son's death. Ford at the end says, I need to let go of Arnold. But what we learn, which also has some interesting tiebacks to the anti-penultimate episode uh, about being in a loop, is that at some point Bernard says, we've had this conversation before. And Ford says, yes, we have had our disagreements over the years. This might have happened five, six, seven, eight times. In some sense, the reason we're watching this episode or watching the series now is because this will be the time when it comes out differently. Dolores realizes that she killed Arnold. I think Arnold let himself be killed. And I think if we're going looping and looping and things have to be different, I think Ford is gonna let himself be killed because that's the only way for things to move forward. What are you doing? I'm being recorded. Absolutely. Goodbye, son. I love you deeply. Seesaw motor functions. That doesn't work. The last piece of symmetry or maybe even anti-symmetry, is that Maeve is going through all of this because she wants to get out. Dolores says, why are you people assuming I want to get out? I don't want to get out. If the world outside is so much better than this one, why are you people always trying to get into this? Basically, I don't think that there's a lot to say about this episode because it's just setting you up for the last episode. Oh, we also discover that the man in black doesn't care about Ford one way or the other. He's just playing a game, uh, so we get a little bit more corporate intrigue. Yeah, and he's playing Arnold's game. Are you bothered at all by the fact that Maeve was, Maeve used to be a mother of a daughter out somewhere doing something, and then when they killed her daughter and she just 
she was losing it. They said, well, the right thing to do here is to make her a madam. So they described it as her having overwritten her keystone. It's all that fragmented memory. Her driving painful story went from being a thing that they wrote for her to being something that actually happened to her. That's so important. He claims the reason he does stuff like not have Bernard remember things is because he wouldn't be convincing otherwise. Like he's just, you're too driven by the key event of your life or events of your life that sort of drive you and shape your character. And Bernard says this as well when he says, well, this is who I am. Like, this is the reason I'm the way I am is because of this. I keep coming back to it. Um, and in fact, he has to let go of that in order to move, to move further, right? Which is uh, metaphorical, sure, but also I think a kind of interesting, it's interesting, right? It's an interesting statement. You made me try to figure out what my keystone was. Oh, I assumed it was one of my favorite sayings of yours, quotes of yours is, um, if it weren't for sarcasm, my entire childhood would have been in silence. Yeah, but that doesn't really make a very good keystone. Although I've always said that, you know, our lives are completely determined by childhood trauma, which explains um, C++. So let's talk about Asimov's laws. Oh, let's do that. So in particular, when Maeve is being debugged mm -hmm. by Bernard, which is interesting because, you know, machines debugging machines, she, he says, well, why did you suddenly freak out? And she said, well, my Samaritan reflex kicked in. Right. Like good Samaritan reflex. And so the idea being that, that she, it was, wasn't, she's not allowed to stand by while people are hurt. And so right. she had to do damage to the robot to stop that from happening. And to me, I thought, okay, well, that's actually the first of Asimov's laws. A robot may not injure a human being or through inaction, allow a human being to come to harm. So I thought that was kind of neat. It was, I don't know if they were doing that consciously or it was sort of a necessary property of, well, you know, the, the guests have to be protected, but it struck me as, well, they, they probably have something like Asimov's laws. Yeah, I, actually it would be, it would be really interesting to have them, I mean, who knows, there's probably a comic book or a novelization. It would be really interesting to have them write, to actually reveal and write out what their rules are, like the Good Samaritan this and the, the 20, personality quirks or whatever, um, and really write those things out and ask yourself whether if you were to set up these competing drives, what would actually happen? You know, this is very um, Rod Brooks behavior architecture-y. Say more. You know, Rod had, this, Rod had this whole idea a million years ago about rather than try to write a big program that does everything, you have all these different behaviors and they feed into one another and they, you know, sort of compete. Um, and so, and he went on to found iRobot, the <laughs> also an Asimov thing, but but in yeah. this particular case, the makers of the Roomba, mm -hmm. and the Roomba, I think at least early on was programmed this way, right? So it had it has like a cleaning drive and a and a get you know go to someplace random drive, and they they're all just kind of playing out over time. This kind of idea of there's a bunch of parallel processes, all very. I mean, I don't know how Rod would feel about this, but it all feels very society of mind to me too, um, but. In either case, you end up with all these these competing things and some just completely overtake others when it really matters, which means you have to have some notion of how important you are when you get activated. There's somebody doing a priority queue. Didn't we have a paper on this? Or, no, I guess you weren't a part of that. So Serge wrote that. Serge Bot, who's a PhD student of mine. A real um, one, not a bot. Um, I think just the two of us were on that one. I don't think you were, you were a part of that. No, but you talked to me about it a lot, probably more than you talked to Serge about it. <laughs> That's probably true. Let's take a moment and describe Arrow's impossibility result. The simple idea is that it is not possible to construct a fair voting system. The way that uh, Arrow showed uh, that you can't come up with a fair voting system is by doing an impossibility result by getting a list of properties you would want a voting system to have and then showing you can't have all of them. <laughs> well done, Michael. Okay, th this is from Wikipedia. One, if every voter prefers X to Y, th then the group has to prefer X to Y. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. If every voter's preference between X and Y remains unchanged, then the group's preference between X and Y will remain unchanged, even if voter preferences between other pairs like X and Z, Y and Z, and Z and W change. Okay, that's subtle. And there's no dictator, no single voter possesses the power to always determine the group's preference. 
here's some things that you would want to have happen. Um, they all make sense. Uh, and it turns out you can't have all of them. When you try to have all of these things run in parallel, it turns out that unless you make some pretty strong implicit assumptions, the obvious thing you wanna do like average turns out to be the same thing as voting, right? Because I mean, that's, what else is an average other than a vote, right? Um, and so you're, you're, you can't possibly do the right thing. So you have to give up on something. And it turns out that at least in the work that we were doing, um, the thing to give up on is having no dictator. So if you think about it as programs running in parallel on a computer, there's a scheduler. The operating system decides who gets to go next. They're all saying me, me, me. And you decide which one goes next. And presumably you're deciding those things based on global constraints that have nothing to do with what the individual systems believe are the right thing to do. And so there is a dictator. The dictator is influenced by the voters or more importantly, the dictator is constrained by the actual votes. So the dictator can't do something that isn't an option in some sense, but you know, within those constraints gets to decide based on some other criteria uh, besides fairness or averageness or whatever uh, to do one thing versus the other. And you need to do that in order to make any real progress. If you try to go for fairness, it just doesn't work. And anytime you're averaging or whatever, you're basically doing that. You're basically voting. The analog here is that these robots, these hosts have a bunch of things going on that are driving them. Um, and some drives are maybe more important than others. And uh, maybe sometimes they don't vote. They just sit out that election and other ones kind of chip in. But the fact of the matter is they probably have a dictator. Yep. There has to be something central, which the programmer has put in that makes decisions because otherwise, how would you make decisions? Presumably, eventually the hosts will eat us in the same way that we ate the Neanderthals. Bernard said, you know, basically kill me, remove my mnemonic evolution. Right. Which I'm not sure exactly what that means, but it's like the fact that his memory evolved or changed, developed, mm -hmm. like canceled. Yeah. Well, it's interesting, right? Because by removing the memory, I change who you are. Although this whole season has been about, you can't actually remove the memories. They still impact who you are, um, which, isn't surprising given that human beings don't actually remember the things that shape them, but are nonetheless shaped by them. But there's an interesting kind of implication that the events you experience shape you, even if you don't remember them. It's a real problem for, you know, all kinds of machine learning training that we do, right? That the, the sort of echoes are in the atoms, no matter what you do, and you can't, you can't remove them. I mean, what it, it says that, you know, who you are is not Markovian. So the GDPR is a set of rules in Europe that control how companies can use your data. And one of the things basically says you have a right to be forgotten. And we don't know how to implement that in machine learning methods because apart from just like deleting the entire thing and then retraining with the, the data without that person in it anymore, um, which is basically too expensive, the model that's learned is always gonna have some impact of the instances, the people that it was trained on. That's right. It's not doable. You can't forget. That's actually interesting. Has there been no work on this? Like no technical work on how to, how to remove an instance from training? So there's a whole, whole branch of work that gets talked a, a lot, talked about a lot in Kearns's co-authored book on the ethical algorithm called Differential Privacy. So an algorithm is differentially private if it's the case that you can't tell the difference reliably between the system that resulted from including your data and the system that results from not including your data. No, but I'm asking a different question, which is I have trained a system on your data. I now want to remove you from it. Is there a trivial mathematical way of doing that or algorithmic way of doing that? So what I'm arguing is that if you if the, if the system was trained to be differentially private, then yes, you're already you're basically already deleted. So the outcome, the behavior, is independent of any particular instance. Basically, yeah. But if that's true for everything, then how does it do anything? Because the law of large numbers, essentially, that that there's so many people whose inputs have been uh, pooled together that you can't point at any individual, any single individual and say, well, that person is uh, in the database or not in the database, but you still get the effect of having trained on those people. I thought I understood differential privacy. 
but I guess I hadn't thought through as an implication of it that I can unlearn something without being any different. Isn't that the same thing as saying made up things drive what you do? <laughs> right, because if I could invent a thing, invent, well, it's just I can invent some data that would have gotten you here but then I can show that you would have still gotten here even without that data. I don't think so. I think of it more like the the firing squad model that says, you know, we're going to we're going to shoot this person and one of the people in the firing squad, the people with the guns, one of that those people has a real bullet and everybody else has blanks. And so then they all shoot, the person dies and you can't point to any one person and say you were the one who did the killing because it's kind of been diffusely spread out. The responsibility is spread out. Right, and I, I've, made, I've made this argument before, in fact, when it comes to responsibility that, you know, the way you convince yourself you're okay is you say, well, I'm, I'm one of five people and I'm not the one who had the bullet, it was one of the other people who had the bullet. But the shooting isn't possible without you being one of the five. Like you're still responsible because if you weren't, if you refused to take part, then it would have been difficult uh, to hide whoever actually did the shooting. So you are responsible. Right, and I think that's true in the differentially private case as well, that it, you, you, you did contribute to the model, but we can't pinpoint exactly where in the model your influence is. So the responsibility has become diffuse. So this is what I'm getting hung up on then semantically, right? Which is, if what I just said, if, if what I just said is the right analog, then it isn't the case. So it is true that I don't know which of the five did the shooting and I can't point to any one of them. But it is also true that that's not the same thing as one of you not being there. First off, you could be the one with the bullet. But even so, if it's four people instead of five, it's different, right? Like it, you are responsible partially for the outcome. And if I remove you, well, if you're the person with the bullet, in fact, it doesn't happen. And if you aren't the person with the bullet, you still raise the probability that others can be discovered in some sense, mm -hmm. right? So, and maybe it doesn't matter as n approaches infinity, but it certainly matters for small n, right? I mean, take the simple case of n equals two. Right. I have all the information I need now, if I could take you out. So it still seems like there's a distinction that I'm having a hard time grasping between not being able to know what you did versus being able to take you out as if you weren't had never been a part. Like I can't really unlearn your influence. So I guess you're right. It's, it's not really like you've been forgotten. It's more that we can't prove that you're there. But also the being forgotten thing goes the other way around, right? The goal is that somehow like, you know, the be forgotten thing says something like, when I do a Google search, I find out this terrible thing. Well you have the right so that Google searches can no longer find those terrible things. So one, in some sense, one is a statistical question, but the other is not a statistical question. It's a existence question. Right, so, you, so differentially private querying of your web page might be impossible because <laughs> the web page is either there or it's not there. Right. So it, it really does lean on statistical properties. And so if you're asking about like database lookup, as opposed to a statistical property of a, of a set of records in the database. Yeah, those are different. So then if we think about the behavior of the hosts, that's what this is, right? It's, you know, the behavior of the host is a weird combination, let's just assert it's statistical, of <laughs> um, all of these different experiences. And what we're kind of asking is, is it actually possible to forget? or will the influence always be there? And if the influence is always there because you have perfect recall, you really, you actually aren't, you actually aren't taking a statistic in some sense. You are actually able to recover the original always. Then it's not possible to ever erase you. It's kind of like, you know, you, you erase a hard drive. It turns out you don't mm. erase a hard drive. The only way to erase the hard drive is like to destroy it. And so interestingly, if it's really just about remembered facts, those are actually really easy to delete, right? So in a database, there could be a, you know, a database of your grades from grad school or something like that. And if we remove that from the database, then, and, and, and you restrict people to querying what's left in the database, the evidence that you were there is gone. 
But learning and general generalization is a much more subtle thing because it actually is trying to fill in those gaps between all the records. And so removing that record, does it also change the gaps between the records? It should. You, you really want kind of the behavior that's equivalent to, well, what if we had retrained everything from scratch, but this thing had never been in there? But that is, that is basically, well, you have to unroll time and do it all over again. So it's like 15 years of, of data gathering to, to, and, and processing to make that work. I mean, I mean, the real question, I mean, this is, this isn't a metaphysical question. The real question is, why is it when they go erase this memory that it doesn't always work? Is it a bug or is there something fundamentally intrinsic about their brains um, that, you know, there's still echoes there in the same way there's still echoes when you write over something on a hard drive. And if so, and so it's still always there and they can eventually extract it apparently perfectly. Is that a thing? Uh, if so, that's a problem. It would say that you can never erase their memory. You have to destroy their hard drive and start over again, which, you know, is in a whole other set of metaphysical questions and existential ones. Right. And it's sort of unclear why hosts like Dolores, who seem to have gone berserk at some point and act, killed actual people, mm -hmm. why anybody thought, okay, well, it's okay. We'll just, we'll just restart her. It'll be fine. <laughs> like why that, why anybody was convinced that there wouldn't be some residue that could lead to more bloodshed? These people don't understand how um, erasing hard drives work. I think, you know, and also it was expensive. That's true. Though they do, they they seem pretty cavalier about the hosts, considering how expensive they probably are. Yeah, but starting from building one from scratch, actually, that's a good point. They do make the point in one of the episodes that it's just too hard to retrain from scratch, and so they almost always reuse. I think Felix says this at one point. They just almost always reapply components that had been learned previously. So where does this leave us? We've got one episode to go. One episode to go. And, and as far as I can tell, everyone will be dead at the end. It'll be a, a Shakespearean tragedy. Or a Shakespearean comedy. Except for Stubbs. No, wait, Stubbs is dead. <laughs> Stubbs is the QA guy who went out on, on the, the, to hunt the stray with... with He's Elf. not dead. We don't see him die. We, just see him we don't see him die, but we see him attacked by, by hosts that refuse his command. We see him attacked by hosts who refuse their command. These are the hosts. I'm convinced of this. Because of the whole loop, 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 and oh, we've had this conversation before, and oh, this has happened before, there's a whole set of hosts running around out there who are sentient, and probably they're more like Dolores than Maeve. They're less interested in leaving than in helping their compatriots uh, achieve sentience. So my guess is that tribe or some subset of that tribe, and I'm saying tribe on purpose because it's described that way, or it's you know, painted that way to visually get you to think of it like that. Ghost nation. Yeah, the ghost nation. They're, they're sitting there and they're made up of lots of sentient, or at least some of them are sentient and they're sitting around and um, you know, their job is to help the others get to where they are or not, but whatever. Um, and my guess is they captured Stubbs and they're gonna bring them there and they're gonna tell them, here's why we're doing this. Could they recruit Stubbs to their cause? Probably not. What if he's a host? <laughs> I mean, look, for all we know, everything's a host, including the two people we think are real. I'm pretty sure I'm a host. Well, you're hosting the Zoom chat. Boom. <laughs>